I'm Linda Sloan Locke. I've been a midwife for 39 years and I'm currently working per diem as a midwife and per diem as a social worker because I went back and got an MSW and I'm now ministering into women in two ways. When I was in nursing school, you know, 150 years ago or so, <laughs> I did my rotation through OB and it seemed that either you loved it or you hated it and I was definitely in the group that loved it. When I saw, when I was present at my first birth, it was such an exciting, wonderful thing. I was like, this is really cool. I really like this. Then I found out that you could be a midwife. But at that time I was in the Midwest. There were no midwifery programs in the Midwest at that point. So it was kind of a dream, but it wasn't a formed dream. It was one of those, well, maybe someday, but nothing really, you know, gelled. After I got the BSN, I went and I worked on my MPH and maternal child health. Figured I loved public health. I loved being able to work with women in their homes and in various environments. And then I had a chance meeting. I was at the airport um, seeing someone off, and a friend was at the airport uh, because her friend was coming in and her friend was B Betty Carrington who was a midwife and I'd actually never met a midwife it was just this kind of thought in my mind and this idea in my mind and I met Betty and she talked to me about midwifery and it just lit this spark you know wow Here's this woman who is a midwife and who's excited about it, and maybe I can actually do it. So that's, that's kind of how the idea was born. I started out as a baby midwife. I went to school at SUNY Downstate doing a rotation, a rotating internship kind of, uh, with, um, uh, through the MIC programs in, in New York. And then I joined a new practice that was starting in a community hospital in New Jersey. North Hudson Hospital, which no longer exists. There were four of us. We covered the clinic and labor and delivery 24-7 with four people, so we were very busy. It was a small hospital, and we, we were really kind of flying by the seat of our pants because in New Jersey at that time, the midwifery, there were really no midwifery regulations. We were um, working under the old granny midwife laws. So we were just doing things as, they, as, as things happened. We did them, as I said, flying by the seat of our pants. Our docs were on call, and sometimes they were on call close by, and sometimes they were on call not so close by. So you never knew how long it was going to take for your backup doc to get in. So you really tried to practice as carefully as you could, but now I'm a baby midwife. I had just come out. So this was, as I look back on it, it was pretty courageous, but you know, who knew? I didn't know at that time. I worked there for about four years, and then I had my second child. Um, then I taught midwifery at UMD, what was then UMDNJ, which is now Rutgers <laughs> University, um, for a year and a half. And then, I think it was home for a couple of years, uh, went back and worked at Jersey City Medical Center for several years in a, again, a big city kind of um, environment there. And from there I was recruited to take on what was a new position at St. Joseph's Hospital in Patterson as what was then called the coordinator of midwifery. Well, when I got there I was basically coordinating myself because I was the only, I was the only midwife in a little tiny teen clinic um, midwives had no uh, stature, no official recognition in the hospital. We weren't nurses, we weren't physicians, we were in no category. So when I went there I had to kind of create the category and convince them that yes I did need to have privileges given by the medical board because they were looking at me like, what? You have two heads. And when I went there I had hoped to grow that practice and I grew that practice from myself to practice with eight midwives um, in three sites. We got the option to do private practice. I had my own private practice there for 10 years, solo private practice. We went to, like I said, several sites, three sites. 
we expanded beyond teens because for a long time they would say, oh, well, the midwives can only take care of the teens. So we had to convince people that, no, we could take care of other people too. <laughs> so we expanded our practice to do GYN care besides OB care. You know, all these were new ideas in that particular setting. They were like, oh, midwives can't do that. Oh, yes, we can. So we also got the uh, option of doing first assisted C-sections. We covered the, the entire OB floor when the residents were doing their educational sessions. So we really expanded it a lot. The last year I was there, was there for 29 years. I retired from that position last May and we were doing about 600 births and 6,000 outpatient visits at that point. I grew it to the point where I was pleased with where it was. I grew it up to be an adult. <laughs> so when I started there, it was like a little baby practice, a little baby service, and it was I got it through adolescence and, you know, into its 20s, and I figured, you know, I could, I could let it fly on its own at that point. The private practice I did for 10 years, which was really very both challenging and rewarding. Some of my stories are from that practice. My first birth, my instructor took me on the floor at Kings County Hospital, and there were two of us. So she checked the woman and said she was six centimeters and walked off down the corridor with the other student and the woman, you know, didn't realize that she was still only supposed to be six centimeters and gave a grunt. In those days, women at Kings County labored on stretchers with these big side rails. And here I am, first day in labor and delivery. How do I get the side rail down? I don't know. So I jumped up on the end of the stretcher and caught the baby. <laughs> and the baby had the amniotic sac still over its face, which is called a call. The woman um, was Haitian. So here I am with this baby in my hands and, and the call. And I'm like, now what do I do? OK, so I take my nail and I rip the thing off the baby's face. So the baby has to breathe. So that was my first birth. In Haiti, uh, babies born with a collar are supposed to have second sight. They're supposed to be, it's, this is supposed to be very spiritually exceptional. Um, and so for me to have my first birth, a baby with a call meant something for, for my career as a midwife. I was told by the woman that, that I helped to birth her baby. The one other experience, they're, they're meant, they're a lot, but the one other experience that, that meant a lot to me was in my practice uh, when I had the private practice. And I had a patient who was a, um, a woman who was coming to me who was a nurse in the hospital, um, cardiac nurse. And I had delivered baby number one and I had delivered the second one. Um, we'd had great births. Um, she came in to, which was supposed to be a well woman visit. And she sat down and the medical assistant brought in a pregnancy test and sat it on the, on the on the side, and I looked, and I was like, really? It was positive, but I looked at her, and I said, you're pregnant? And she's like, yes. So, okay, she's very happy. We did the exam, and I felt a little lump in her breast. But she had just stopped nursing, like two or three weeks before, when she figured that she might be pregnant again. So I thought, well, it's probably a little bit of a clogged duct, you know, just some warm soaks, come back in two weeks and we'll check and see what, what it's like. It wasn't painful, nothing like that. She came back and it was still there. And I said, well, you know, why don't we just get an ultrasound and take a look at it? Got the ultrasound and it was what they call suspicious. So I called my uh, consulting physician. She followed up with the surgeon and it turned out that she had breast cancer. She was 33 years old. She continued the pregnancy. And what I remember about this pregnancy that was so important for her, one of the questions you had, you know, we were talking about was what is the heart of midwifery? And I think the heart of midwifery is the trust that women put in, give to us. They, they have such trust in us that we will care for them and champion them and do the best for them. Many people, the oncologists, the perinatologist wanted her to terminate the pregnancy. And my position was that you are the only one who can decide what's best for you. Whatever your choice is, 
I'll support you in that choice. She chose to continue the pregnancy. She had a lumpectomy. She had some positive nodes. She opted not to do chemo during the pregnancy because she was concerned about the effects of the chemotherapy, chemotherapy might have on the baby. She was a nurse. She knew what the risks were. They had been very clearly explained to her by a variety of people. And so I continued to collaboratively manage her pregnancy. She got to 36 weeks and she was breech. A wonderful perinatologist who was working with me with her did a version for us. And the baby turned and her water broke. And she went into labor. She was a very quiet woman. She had been quietly going through this difficult pregnancy very quietly. She labored quietly with all her babies and all her labors. She was a very quiet person in labor. So she labored quietly through this labor and she got to ready to push out the baby. She gave the most, the deepest noise from deep within her being. It was like she had been holding all of this in and protecting this baby for 36 weeks. She could now let it out and let it go. And all of that came out and the baby came out <laughs> at the same time. We were so connected and the bond with her was so strong and she had such faith that I, <laughs> I'm gonna cry. She had such faith that I would do the best for her and such gratitude that I did stay with her, you know, just not physically, but, but emotionally throughout this pregnancy and help her to achieve what her goal was, which was to have a healthy baby, which she did. She decided um, to not start chemotherapy and so that she could nurse the baby for six months, which she did, and then she started chemotherapy, but she had metastasis and she died when, the, when that baby was three. On her postpartum visit, she brought me a needlepoint of a stork uh, with three balloons that were representative of the three babies that we birthed together. So to me, that's really what being with woman means. Being a midwife, you always feel like you're between the pillar and the post. You're neither this nor that very often, especially when you work in a hospital setting, and I've worked in a hospital setting my entire midwifery career. I've had this conversation with my son. Uh, he's an engineer and works with a big <laughs> corporation, which shall remain nameless, but um, he talks about the difficulties of being African American in a very white culture. And my response to him is, well, try being a non-white, non-male, non-physician in a culture that is dominated and controlled by white male physicians. And operating in a big hospital environment, that's what was my everyday existence. You feel as if you need to do things better than everyone else. You're always looking over your shoulder. There have been a lot of specific incidents that have pointed to people saying, well, do you really think she can do that because she's a woman, she's a midwife, and she's not white? So those challenges have always been there. They're there working in the hospital. They're there. They've been within ACNM. I can remember going to my first ACNM meeting and not feeling very comfortable, looking around and saying, I don't feel really comfortable here. I, I felt a little bit on the fringes of the organization. So those things, over time, have they gotten better? Yes, but they still exist. And those barriers still do exist. This country is changing. This country is going to be majority people of color. If we as midwives don't look like the country that we're practicing in, 
we're going to cease to exist. I think it's not just important, I think it's essential. There need to be more people that look like the people we're taking care of. It started when I was in nursing school. I went to the University of Michigan. I, left Chicago. I grew up in Chicago, and I went to the University of Michigan for nursing school. And there were four of us in my class. <laughs> and we decided, we made a conscious decision, we were going to all sit together in the front row so that everybody could see that we were there. When I went to Michigan, it was the first year of what they called Opportunity Awards, where they made a, um, a real effort to bring uh, in students um, from uh, disadvantaged areas, Detroit and whatever. I wasn't one of those students. I came from Chicago. I came in, I applied just like anybody else and got in just like anybody else. But people were surprised. Oh, you were one of those Opportunity Award people. No, I'm not. I applied just like the girl down the hall and got in with the same criteria as everyone else. Oh, really? <laughs> oh, you got the highest exam score on this exam. Oh, really? How could you do that? You know, you're female, you're black. How could that be? So there's always that measure of surprise when you excel that people have that continues to happen and continues to sometimes catch you aback a little bit because one, one wants to think that we've progressed past that, and some, in some ways we have, and in some ways we haven't. When I was at Kings County, um, I remember being shocked at a room full of women who came for their prenatal visit and came in the morning with their children, with their lunch, and sat all day to wait to be seen by the midwife uh, we couldn't even put everyone on the table to be examined and measure her fundal height. You could put women on the table at prescribed visits. The first visit, 20 weeks, 28 weeks, and then 36 weeks weekly. Any visits in between that, you sat in a chair, the patient sat in a chair, they had their blood pressure and weight taken, they dipped their urine, and then you looked at her and said, okay, is your baby moving okay? Good. <laughs> Your belly looks about the right size. It was like second class care. And I remember one day wanting to bring a, a woman back and put her on the table and, and actually listen to the baby's heartbeat. And it wasn't one of those prescribed visits. And the resident physician who was there says, oh, no, you can't bring her. I said, no, this is why I had to make my case in order to get the woman on the table. And he just was not having it. He just didn't think this was important. And I finally looked at him and said, you do, would you want your wife to be taken care of this way? And he looked at me in such astonishment and amazement and anger that I would in any way equate his wife to the women we were caring for. So it's that kind of subtle racism and sometimes not so subtle racism that is still was an issue when I was a younger midwife and you still see that you know these these patients are not the same as me you know at the beginning I talked about going into social work and one of the reasons that this has seemed a good segue for me at the end of my career is um, when I was in my sec second year in getting my MSW, one of the readings, uh, there was a quote, the social worker is the midwife to the soul. There are so many similarities between social work and midwifery. As a midwife, I, I helped women to bring forth their children on their own, you know, with their own power, helping them to empower themselves to bring forth their child in the way they wanted. As a social worker, I work with women mostly um, to help them become empowered and bring forth themselves. So I'm helping them birth themselves. There's so much similarity in the two things. I'm right now working with um, women who are survivors of uh, domestic violence and sexual assault. I had a young woman who started me on that road. She had been abducted and held captive um, and was then pregnant and came in in labor absolutely terrified, unable to have any male be near her or touch her in any way. 
and we labored. I basically labored in the bed with her, holding her through the entire labor, um, and helped her deliver that baby. And that really awoke in me this understanding of how sexual assault and domestic violence and 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 sexual violence can have such a, a profound impact on women. So what I'm trying to do now in, in social work is to try to meld the two and, and talk about the relationships of, of sexual assault and domestic violence to health and how the two interact and intersect. I think I'm doing that pretty well. I think the, the, the biggest uh, thing, the best thing that we do is the ability to truly hear women and hear women's stories. You know, when you're preparing for social work and they talk to you about, you know, you need to hear your clients' stories. Midwives are already experts at hearing women's stories. And then after they hear that woman's story, helping her to, to make her story or her dream the reality. So basically, that's still what I'm doing as a social worker, um, just on a different, in, in a different, slightly different sphere. But I think that, that really listening, you know, we say listening to women. As midwives, we, we know how to do that. We know how to listen to women. We know how to hear women. We know how to hear women, not just with our ears, but with our hearts and with our souls. I remember when I first came to New Jersey, I, I you know, had done my nursing in Michigan and, and been introduced to OB in, in Michigan and birth in Michigan, and we did caudal anesthesia. And so women were pretty calm at birth. And then I came to New Jersey and I took nursing students to a hospital that was giving scopolamine to women and knocking them out. And I'm like, where am I? Where have I landed? <laughs> What's going on here? We've come a ways. I mean, there's, it's better for midwifery than it was when I graduated. I feel like mental health is still 20 years behind midwifery. So, you know, I think both, both areas still have a long way to go. There's so much uh, stigma around just mental health issues as well as sexual assault and domestic violence. Sexual assault is about 10 to 15 years behind domestic violence. I mean, there's more, I think there's a greater understanding about domestic violence now than there was 20 years ago. But sexual assault is a little bit further behind because people, it's still something that people are just not comfortable talking about. A lot of healthcare providers still, we don't understand how that impacts the way women utilize healthcare, how they experience health or unhealth. Part of what I think I've tried to do as a midwife also is bring the midwifery voice to other issues um, because I think we have so much to say from our experience. For instance, one thing I was real proud of that I did was to work um, with the issue of black infant mortality, um, which is also real close to my heart. And, you know, I got an email or a do you know anyone who might, might want to be on this commission? I said, well, I can be on the commission. Um, it was the New Jersey Blue Ribbon Commission on Black Infant Mortality. So there I was, and I was the only midwife there. And so in all the language of the commission, as the commission began to look at this and they started talking about health care providers, they always said physicians. So just my being there made it possible for the language of that commission to come out and say, healthcare provider, or to be a more inclusive language. Um, and that, that's important. I remember being at um, a, uh, a conference of the Maternal Child Health Consortium in New Jersey at one point, and Dr. Satcher was speaking. He was the former Surgeon General. And I used to be really shy when I was younger, but I, being a midwife makes you overcome that. <laughs> He was talking about how it's so important for women to see a physician at the beginning of their pregnancy and, and see a physician for pre-pregnancy planning and early prenatal care. And finally, I couldn't stand it anymore. And I put my hand up and I said, well, there are, you know, you're a wonderful physician. You've done wonderful things. But when you talk about women only seeing physicians, you're excluding me from the conversation. I've been a midwife for 25 years at that point. 
And oh no, I didn't put my hand up in the meeting. I was introduced to him later. That's what it was. I was introduced to him later, and that's what I said to him. And the woman who introduced me was a physician friend of mine. She looks at me and she's just like, "I can't take you anywhere, because you just <laughs> you just don't know how to act." And I said to her, "No, this is the way I'm supposed to act, because it's important to remind people." And he was he was taken aback, and he said, "You know, I didn't realize that I was saying that." He says, I love midwives. I think midwives are wonderful. I think midwives give wonderful care. I said, then you need to remember that when you're writing your speech notes. Because as a, as a person who's cared for women for over 25 years, sitting in this, in this room, I felt invisible when you were up there talking. I really did. And he was like, well, that wasn't my intent. And I said, well, you know, a lot of things may not be the intent, but if, they, if that's the effect that they have, that's the effect that they have. One of the greatest victories was my position at St. Joe's because when I went to that institution, midwifery was something that nobody kind of knew existed. And by the time I left, everybody knew we were there. You know, I had accomplished everything I set out to accomplish, which was, which was pretty darn great. <laughs> I wanted to grow, grow the practice, I wanted to expand it, I wanted to have the private practice option. By the time I left, I was um, the only non-physician chief, division chief in the institution, so I had elevated midwifery to a point that it was um, a force to be reckoned with in the institution, and, and so I was really proud of that. I think I'm also really proud of the, the work I've done in the community because People now see, a lot of people now see midwives as, as experts in certain areas um, that didn't think that maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, and, you know, ask midwives to be on committees and task forces and that kind of thing. So I think those are some, some victories that in the, in the communities I've worked in, I, I think I can look to. I really don't. I think that um, most of the things that I set out to do when I became a baby midwife and some things that I never even thought about doing when I was a baby midwife, I pretty much accomplished. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with the way things went. There were some experiences that I think might have been great. I never did a home birth and that would have been nice um, to experience that. But I wouldn't say it's something that I necessarily regret had some issues with life-work balance, especially when my children were smaller, that made, um, made practicing difficult. Possibly some of the things that I wanted to do at that time, I had to delay because of that life-work balance issue. Um, but that's not something I regret because that was something that I needed to do at that time. Well, one of the things I remember when I went to work at um, UMDNJ, it was very hard in those days, we we're talking about the early, late 70s, early 80s, to find a part-time job in midwifery. People wanted you to work 150% or not at all. And I remember thinking back then, if I ever have my own service, midwifery service, midwifery practice, I think it's important for us to mother the midwives. We need to allow midwives at least as much time as we would want for our own patients that we take care of. Why do we champion for our, the women we, to take, we take care of to have the enough time to be with their babies and bond with their babies, and we don't do the same for our peers and our colleagues? So I established a practice that was not a 24-7 practice because women could then come and have a more defined schedule. And there were certain trade-offs with that, but it drew a lot of people who were very happy with that kind of, of schedule because they could have a decent life, life work balance. Sometimes I think in midwifery we kind of get an idea of what's the perfect midwife, and if another midwife doesn't fit that mold, we somehow think she's not as good a midwife as this perfect midwife image. 
and I think we need to be more accepting of all different ways of, and scopes of care and kinds of midwifery. You know, it's not a one-size-fits-all profession. Each midwife has to find her own path that's best for her. You cannot give 150% to your profession and 150% to your family, and what's left for you? <laughs> I think that's something in midwifery we need to address is self-care, and I'm taking that, you know, I'm borrowing from social work because the social work profession does a lot with self-care, and in midwifery we really don't do very much, and we really need to look at that. You know, we tell our patients this and we tell our moms this, if you don't take care of yourself, you can't take care of your family. If we don't take care of ourselves, we can't take care of our patients. So we need to, we need to honor that a little bit more and honor the individual midwives need to do that, you know, without thinking that she's less of a midwife. Yeah. I think midwifery means being with women, being caring for women throughout their lives, and truly being with women, being there for women. It's more than just the the protocols. <laughs> and you know the scope of practice it is the sense that you have that you and the women you and the women you are taking care of are in sync and you have the same goals you understand what her goals are and you're going to help her you know attain those goals being with women i guess the biggest joy is still baby catching <laughs> and that's what i'm going to miss there's nothing like that little slithery person coming into the world, but it's okay. You know, I did it for almost 40 years, and the last birth <laughs> was very similar to the first. It was the first of twins. The physician who I was on with that day knew it was like my second to last call, and this was a woman I'd taken care of in her other pregnancies with singleton babies. Um, so we went into the operating room to deliver because it was twins and we didn't deliver her in the birthing room. And I went in and, I, and, and he was putting on his gloves and I turned around to do something at the table and he just yelled out, Lynn! And I turned around and the baby's coming out. So barehanded, I just caught the baby. I said to him, well... This is, this is the way it should be. This is the way I caught my first baby. This is the way I caught my last baby. I'm done. And it was like, you know, okay, it's time. It's all right to be done with this, this aspect of it. But there's nothing like that. There's just nothing like that.